This March, a pair of twins, a killer kid, a vampire, and a cult walk into a pub. A March has come, and imagine how weird that pub occasion would be if all these people actually walked into it. Luckily, it's all fictional. It's all in my head. It, it, it's all just uh, stuck there. Hello, <laughs> this is Maya, and this is by all means necessary. The topic of this March is going to be everything weird, which totally fits my personality and life. So we are covering different sets of characters, which will hopefully provoke different sets of motives as well. And how I actually found out about this story is because, as I mentioned, I sign up to a lot of Patreon feeds, which I encourage you to do as well including my Patreon, which is obviously in the link below, because people are lazy and they just want to click on links. So click on it, sign up to my Patreon and other beautiful podcast Patreons, you see? And then just listen to true crime non-stop and never like live in silence and be disturbed and have insomnia. It's beautiful. I'm sipping on Coke Zero, the energy one. Disgusting, okay? Coke Zero in itself? Great. This thing has like a mixture, I think, of Coke Zero and Guarana. Listen, <laughs> I, just, I just need to get through it because I actually bought this can, so um, at least I'll be hyped, but it's just the flavor. It's just nasty, man. Um, yeah, should we fucking start this episode? As I was saying, I listened to this Patreon episode. It's the Brand Headed Podcast Patreon. Again, great feed. These girls are doing such amazingly well. They probably don't even need me directing you to their Patreon or their feed, but because they actually made it to the charts, not like me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I will, because I like to support fellow true crime podcasters. So when I first heard about this case, I was like, this is not, this is another Luigi Longi story. This is not true. And then, uh, and then I did uh, my Google search, and let me just say, this is a lot more true than a lot of things that I have covered. So, in March 1993, Jennifer Gibbons died after falling into a coma. She and her twin, June, were about to get released from Broadmoor Hospital, after having spent 11 years for their acts of burglary and arson. It is the twins' childhood and life habits that earned them the name of Silent Twins and attributed them magical and mysterious traits. The twins would write into their diaries that one had to die for the other one to survive, as Jennifer willed herself into her death, to let her twin live a normal life. This is a story about exploration of the motives behind the strange and sudden death of one of the silent twins. So, in the classic motive narration style, we are going backwards, however, as uh, I mentioned, Jennifer Gibbons fell into a coma, so there was no like dramatic discovery of the body here. She fell into a coma, actually they were, so the twins were spending 11 years in Broadmoor Hospital, the UK, yeah, I'm going local guys, I am covering such a local case. And just one day, you know, after 11 years, so they were almost actually, they, they had their appeal and they were about to be released. And it was just a few days before the release, Jennifer actually told the nurse, hey, uh, you know what, I'm actually going to die. And uh, the nurse was like, funny. Yeah, you know when somebody just comes up with like random shit and you're like, just brush it off and then they actually die? <laughs> yeah, uh, doesn't happen in real life, does it? But this is real, this case is real, okay? Yeah, so she says to the nurse she's going to die. She actually, the very next day she falls horribly sick. A few days after she falls into a coma and she passes away. So she died at the hospital where they tried to treat her, but yeah, she just died uh, from her coma. And there was no foul play found, so this is not your case. So one twin murdering the other or somebody murdering Jennifer. It is more about something I never thought I would cover on this podcast. The motives behind how did her death come about was, might have pushed her into an early premature death. Is it magic? Is it mystical? Or are these just attributes people gave these to you? I wish you know when I behave weird, somebody's like, oh, it's mystical. 
there is something strange about her, but like, let's worship the shit out of her. No, when I say something weird, everybody's like, oh, Maya, <laughs> she thinks she's a comedian. I just ignore what she's saying. And then I fucking impose a podcast on you. Okay. So, June is still alive, by the way. And, well, her account of events just before uh, Jennifer's murder is that Broadmoor actually hospitalized violent offenders. We will actually go through like a quick list of uh, who were special celebrities at Broadmoor. There was a lot of different strange characters, like people who were there for different psychiatric reasons, but yeah, who have committed much more gruesome crimes than theft and arson. So these twins didn't actually stand a chance. So June actually recounts how this doctor came in and diagnosed them as psychopaths. I mean, these are silent twins, okay? They don't talk. How did this doctor come in and diagnose two silent people as psychopaths? What is this science (laughs) of 80s and 90s? What is this? How are we doing this? And then basically their destiny was just puffed by tragedy because everybody, of course, then just treated them as psychos, as which to a certain degree then in that kind of place makes them equal to different serial killers and rapists and murderers. And June basically describes something that actually has a scientific term, which is folie adou, and this is like a shared illusional disorder. So there is one of the twins was the inducer and one was the receiver. So Jennifer, the one that died, was the inducer. She was sort of the more dominant one. And then June would, June says that even after her death, she would still fear her sister. And she was scared her sister is gonna haunt her even post death. Just tells you a lot of how these two communicate during the life, doesn't it? So June right now is still living in uh, rural Wales and she's taking care of their parents. She stopped writing and commemorating everything in her diaries, which is what both sisters do, used to do during their lives. Uh, but she started talking. So hey, there was no, there's no inducer anymore. You know, her sister might haunt her in death, but hey, she's at least uh, speaking. And now, before we move on to the next section, let me leave this one with a poem that she wrote. <laughs> I wanted to say published. The published is not. It's engraved. <laughs> published is not a word. It's engraved into her sister's headstone. We once were two, we two made one. We no more two, through life be one. Rest in peace. Slightly creepy, slightly sets the tone for the whole of the next section. Yeah, let's go on to their time in Broadmoor and their rehab. It's usually be the crime section, but in this case it is more of, well, the crime and punishment for them, which in this case was rehab. Okay, so June and Jennifer were based in rural Wales. They were two black kids, um, two immigrant family, which um, even even today in rural Wales or anywhere rurally in the UK is considered strange. But at the time that they were born, they were pretty much the only two black kids there. So as sort of as teenagers as they were super bored and uh, super silent, um, they would do these... They started sort of with petty crimes, like, hey, they would rob a shop, you know, they would, like, steal from the markets, they were just, like, bored out of their minds. But then it kind of escalated to arson, because they just thought they were indestructible and nobody cared, because they were black and they weren't causing that much trouble, so the police didn't care either. They were kind of outcasts. But then, obviously, when it escalated to arson, they kind of burned a few shops down, including a tractor shop. And the police actually sent them to Broadmoor Hospital. So now, I... Again, it's one of those things where, like, criminals just play about and they just think, like, oh, yeah, nah, like, I am, like, I'm so over justice system, like, I can definitely play everything to, into my favor. And then you actually can't, because for them, like, these two were actually, like, didn't expect this kind of sentence at all, but their length of the term was indefinite, so it's not even, like, being sent to one of the worst psychiatric hospitals in the UK. No, it's indefinite term as well. And for them, they just basically signed the death sentence at this trial. In their mind, this was it. So it was at this trial when I believe that June decided her twin needs to stop being a part of her by all means necessary. We'll go heavily into background next. But they used to do everything in sync until this point. 
Of course, because now they are hospitalized. They are the youngest patients in Broadmoor. Like the nurses at the hospital, of course, like you will see this throughout their childhood as well. But every time they wanted to fix them, they would try to keep them separate. But like every time they would keep them separate here. The, the twins would refuse to eat for days, like when they would be away from each other. And instead of what they used to do in the past, which is any anger that they would have, they would unleash it onto each other. Now they started unleashing it onto nurses or anybody who was there in their proximity at that time, because they couldn't unleash it onto, onto their sisters. But again, like many times in their background, every time they would try to separate them, they would end up needing to set up an ultimatum. They would become stiff, so they would have to like physically place them onto beds. Now, every time they realized that this wouldn't actually work, and the separation doesn't work, what they would do is set them this ultimatum, where they would tell them that one twin is actually would actually end up in a better facility than the other, so that they are going to completely separate them. None of the twins could actually stand the thought of one being assigned to better facilities than the other and having different conditions. The differences for these pair of twins were not something that was acceptable at all. They had to do everything the same, everything in sync. They had to become one. To explain in a lot of bizarre details what brought these twins to the hospital and what brought one of them to their death, let's focus on the background, shall we? Okay, so as mentioned, these twins were the only black few black kids in Wales at the time. So the, the family was from Barbados. Barbados. Why am I saying this? Their dad moved to join Royal Air Force as a technician. So they were both born in 1963. And Jennifer was more dominant than June, even though June was born 10 minutes before her. These twins actually had three other siblings. Were non-existent characters in this story. Nobody mentions their much like their interactions with the other siblings. They apparently sort of spoke to their younger one. It is all just about the relationship of these two and how brilliantly weird it is. So even as kids, it was really clear that they were going to have a speech problem. The kids did not communicate with the rest of the family and they would only speak to each other. And even then it would be this incomprehensible, really fast manner of speaking. They would constantly try to be in sync, which is one of the creepiest things when you think about it. So they try to synchronize everything from the way they would eat to the famous one was their steps. So they would try to like step and walk in the, in the exact same pace at the exact same time. And they followed through this everywhere. Like wherever they would like they would be placed in school or in Broadmoor. They would do this thing where like one would control the others like jennifer would usually control june and would kind of be like that's like look of the eye when it's like yep this is when you start this is when you finish this is how fast it's going and then they would just like stare at each other and do it the exact same bizarre time so i don't know how there's no horror story about this apparently there's a documentary on bbc how is this not like a scene in every fucking horror movie yes chab 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 Okay, so at the time, like, obviously, like, racism played a role here heavily as well. So, as the only two black kids in rural ways at the time, they were bullied at school to the point that people, that kids would pull their hair out. So, and the teachers had to let them leave the school at least, like, five minutes earlier, so that they wouldn't be subject to bullying, like, on their way home as well. But obviously, if you think about this, this just worked further to isolating them. So they're already isolating themselves at home because they only communicate to each other and now they're isolating themselves at school as well by leaving earlier and not communicating to literally anybody else and at the dinner table as well they always be silent while yeah the family was just sitting there and like trying to initiate spark the conversation and trying to um and having hopes that they're going to suddenly speak up to them and this reminds me <sighs> I can't believe I'm actually going to sell this is such a pointless part of the story. <laughs> Feel free to skip it through. But this is like I'm not also I'm not doing this just because of this dumbass joke. So my dad's side of the family is from Montenegro, which was Serbia and Montenegro at once in a quick geography lesson. But then I think 2006 they split and now we sort of dislike each other. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Still have family there. And this is, this dumb joke always comes up. So what Montenegrins are famous for is being lazy. 
totally not and it's not like I'm recording this from bed there's this really dumb joke which is which they would always tell me when I would not want to communicate with that side of the family at the dinner table and I kind of find that it's applicable to this story as well so is that this kid didn't speak this kid from Montenegro didn't speak until he was like nine years old and then it's just at the dinner table one day he said pass me the salt and everybody was like, well, what the fuck, like, why didn't you speak until now? And uh, he said, uh, till this point, I didn't have any remarks. That's the joke. Insert laughter here, please. That is what my childhood was every fucking time we would meet with that side of the family. Okay? This is what these twins were doing, but they just never actually spoke up. Okay, yeah. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Well... <laughs> The joke aside, um, how about we discuss that parenting? This is definitely like not helicopter parenting. In fact, if anything, I would define this as neglect. I mean, I understand like somebody else bullies your child because of racism. They're not having great time in school. These parents did not give a fuck. Like they would have like they knew that they were, these twins are going to have like some speech problems since you know really early age probably like when they were a few months or like one year something old when do you learn how to speak everybody different times but yeah probably when they were one two years old and to, to do nothing these parents basically let these kids rule rule their lives and rule their own lives and just do whatever the fuck they wanted which makes for a great story don't neglect your kids maya the non-parent strikes again so there is this event when and they had vaccinations at school, and this doctor was just about to vaccinate them for tuberculosis. And again, in a really creepy fashion that I visualize so heavily. Like, he remembered these two, and he actually went to speak to their parents because they were so fucking creepy. So he would, like, of course, you know, you're vaccinating a child, you're playing that goofball. It's like, oh, haha, it's just, you know, it won't hurt. It's a quick one. And then he just looks up into their eyes and he just sees them staring deadly into him like, this is not even fun. <laughs> like, let's just get this over with. And then, you know, a few minutes later, the other one sits down and again gives him the same dead stare, doesn't speak at all. So he went actually to their parents' house to check up on them, be like, is this, are they okay? Are they doing okay? And the parents were like, no. There's no need for fuss. They just dismissed it basically being like, hey, yeah, they, our daughters are just shy. Yo, listen, just people stare at people's eyes, okay? They're shy. Are they shy or are they mad? Yeah, man, there's a difference between being an introvert and having fucking dead eyes. <laughs> but what I keep wondering all throughout this story is how different would it have been if these kids were either white, you know, and how much more attention would have been given here by the teachers, or if they were black and violent, and how much sooner they would have actually ended up in prison or in Broadmoor. So again, all through their lives, they have been diagnosed multiple times by different people. So all these doctors that would actually see them or speak to them would define them as mystical, again, partially due to them being fucking silent and creepy as shit. But again, partially due to racism and their background. You know, family from Barbados. Oh, what do we know about Barbados? Oh, they're black. Oh, fuck knows what happens with that family, right? So they started therapy at the age of 14, again, by recommendations of school and school teachers. And the only ter the only way, listen, these kids are like, these fucking twins were boss ass bitches. They were just ruling other people's lives. Who gave these kids this much power? they went to therapy and like they would not speak this therapist had to negotiate with them they would not speak until she would leave them in the room alone with a what's it called with a tape recorder what are you on about like the whole point of therapy is for you to speak to another human no and it's this therapist that actually identified that they that they weren't just saying gibberish when they would communicate to each other super fast. The language they were using is actually a mix of Barbados slang and English. And you know, after a few sessions, this therapist is like, there's nothing mystical about these two girls. If anything, when I leave them in the room, one twin is actually holding all of the power over the other. And not just that, but what she realized is that June actually wanted to speak, but wouldn't because Jennifer was controlling her all this time. 
So now this therapist suggests that they assign them basically one teacher each. So it's again like, hey, let's kind of try to separate them at least. To get them like to fucking see themselves as their own personalities and for one not to control the other. And these teachers actually recall a really creepy way that the twins would look at each other in the canteen so that they would eat and sing. So they were, they're not dropping this synchronicity thing anywhere. <laughs> so even in the canteen, they would try to like eat, I don't know, jacket potatoes at the exact same time so that they're like finishing it at the, t- at the time, they're chewing the right amount of times together. Listen, <laughs> it's twins. There's nothing mystical. So now again, they're like, yeah, but it doesn't just work for them to be separated by, you know, their own head teachers. Let's, this therapist is then suggesting that they send them to different schools. This is when they lose their shit because they're like okay this is serious now uh we're not in control of this situation as uh 14 year olds <laughs> we are uh losing uh, oh shit so this is when, okay the, the way they describe this event is so they're at a therapist yeah and therapist office lounge whatever the fuck maybe it was in school i don't know where this is yeah <laughs> just visualizing it heavily without knowing where it is and they told them hey we're gonna send you to separate schools both of them at the exact same time clench their fists. Now this is that famous cartoon me moment, you know, with the clenched fist. Just imagine that happening at the exact same time with these creepy twins that look exactly the same, try to behave in silence. <laughs> Horror movie shit, okay? And at that time, so just after clenching their fists, they express like all of the anxiety, all of the anger over this new information by fighting each other. And not fighting, they were digging their nails into each other. So there's multiple times in the story when they were expressed like this violence because of course any anxiety or any triggers they, they try not to communicate to other people so they would express them at each other and then afterwards they would just continue like yeah it, it's fine. Um, but it just led to even further isolation. So in, for them again it's just this manipulation fucking mindset where they're like no I'm ruling my own life and your life. So, right after this event, they would, again, in the weirdest way, how are these small fucking 14 year olds doing this shit? They bring them home and they would just lie and, you know, stiffen their body so that even when somebody else tried to move them, they just be lying there like that weight. Again, just leading to moral isolation, like you're not helping yourselves out. Like nobody's helping anybody out in this story. So this experiment of their separation into different schools lasted for a whole two months because guess what? No progress has been made even when they've separated because again they don't know what the fuck to do with these twins and they just let these twins rule their life. Like how many people with probably some degrees, right? From these doctors, therapists and stuff were involved here. There's just no progression that's been made. Like, I understand parents maybe don't know what the fuck they're doing, but there's a lot of people professionally who just say, like, the way to do it is to separate them. And then when they separate them, these twins just still do whatever they want. This separation sort of led to people realizing they're actually good at writing. They would write and they would always give them, even in prison, I don't know, is this still a thing or was it a thing there? Because it's again psychiatric hospital, right? That everybody expected them to write diaries. So during this separation, June was trying to express her identity. So when they realized nothing was working and they reunite them back into the same school, they noticed that June was actually again trying to express her identity. But Jennifer was caught screaming at her, you are Jennifer, you are me. Again, just implying that they're the same person. Now is when, okay, if, if the shit wasn't going real, it wasn't getting real by now. Now is uh, when somebody visualizes this and directs it onto a fucking movie screen, okay? Now is when they take this somehow escalates, even though they're trying to fix them. So these two would take turns trying to be each other. And when they, in their heads, right, want to return into their own body, they would scream at one another, give me back myself and I'll give you back yourself. <laughs> Just imagine that you creepy looking twins that look exactly the same, just telling this to each other like, um, what is going on? But the thing is, so they left school when they were 16 and nobody, like teachers or their parents, supported them in searching for jobs. So technically their lives actually just ended when they were 16 because it's like, 
what are they going to do? They're silent. They're not communicating to anybody. They were just unemployed, collecting unemployment checks. And just being forever isolated. Because what else can they do? So they would just stay at home? Stay at home and not even attempt to have like a normal life. So uh, did this lead to the establishment of any healthy habits? You guessed it. It, it's, it gets fucking weirder. These kids are like, okay, what have we been doing so far? We're actually okay at writing. What do we write about? Because our lives are just dead as hell. So they would just keep diaries of their mundane, boring lives. But this is when they actually start creating these plots. And the plots, of course, because they're spending 99% of their fucking time in their rooms. The plots involve dolls. Dolls are a fucking trigger, okay? Dolls are a trigger for me. <laughs> dolls are creepy. I didn't play with them as a kid, which probably led to my whole family believing I was a lesbian until a certain age. Doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> I just gave my Barbies to my brother. My bro, uh, the dolls just creeped me out ever since I was a kid. And even as a kid, I was like, why am I being given these uh, freaking creatures? They are creepy. The way they stare at me is fucked up. They're like, oh, you want to sleep with a doll? No. Why would I want to sleep next to a fucking... <laughs> next to some human face on an inhuman body? They're dolls. That's what they are. Human face, inhuman body. Whew. Okay, so this is... I, I just love that this was documented, though. So they would give these dolls names, ages, and... Causes of death. <laughs> you guessed it. The plots are incredible. So, okay, okay, please. Not just that, but like, they would sometimes give them family names. So, did they want their family dead? And sometimes, yeah, it would be just inventing names. So, here are some, because this is what this podcast is all about doll names and doll causes of death. Fuck the peak of my career. <laughs> oh, God. June Gibbons, aged 9, died of leg injury. George Gibbons, aged 4. Bluey Gibbons, great names, great names. Aged 2 and a half, died of appendix. Appendix, a what? Do we even... This is pain, like, appendix, what? Appendicitis? Appendix. Somebody educate these twins, okay? Just kidding, just kidding. I'm not saying anything again about parenting, okay? Peter Gibbons, aged 5, adopted, presumed dead. No further details, of course. <laughs> Julie Gibbons, aged 2 and a half, died of a stamped stomach. What is a stamped stomach? Polly Morgan Gibbons, oh, double barrel, wow, okay, what's that plot like? Aged 4, died of a slit face and so, oh my god, died of a slit face, no further details, again. And Susie Pope Gibbons died the same time of a cracked skull. Again, are these Gibbons attacking each other? What is happening? So they would write about these dolls. They would have plays with these dolls and radio shows with them. And everything would end in death, as you presumed correctly. Oh my god. And they're like... So they're 16. Playing with dolls and writing plays with dolls. And they're spending every single goddamn minute with each other. And does it... Can it get weirder? Yes. Yes, it can. Because in their mind, and due to everybody in their life, and how they treated them and their parents, and their parents ne never having had conversations about, you know, the bees and the sexual intercourse, these kids are like 16, 17 now. They're just trying desperately not to grow up so they're obviously feeling hormonal feeling horny and they can't explain it they don't know what is happening they don't understand that this is normal so what they do is like they keep their chest bound so they keep their chest like taped so that their breasts don't grow and they still just desperately try to isolate themselves and keep typing their novels and writing their novels it's nothing worse than being a fucking hormonal teenager stuck in a room with your twin sister, without speaking to anybody. I, 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 honestly, I'm surprised that this story does not involve incest. Very surprised. Like, you, like, it wouldn't actually fucking surprise me at all if it did. Okay, so they're still in the room. Now they're typing their novels on typewriters. Do we have titles of these novels? Yes, of course we do. <laughs> so June actually published this one. And I'm gonna post the cover of the book on Twitter. Because... <laughs> 
you know that saying don't judge a book by its cover you should definitely fucking judge judge this book by its cover it's depressing <laughs> It's that thing where like you n the back of your neck kind of stands up and it's not even anything in particular you just after knowing the story that you're like shit this is one depressing ass book the name of the book is pepsi cola addict what is it about you wonder a novel about a boy who has who was sent to reform school after having an affair with a teacher healthy thoughts he healthy thoughts for a 16 year old to write this Oh, did Jennifer write anything? Yes, she has never been published though. But she wrote a book named Discomania about violent teenagers driven mad by disco music. Okay, I actually like this one. I'm not even gonna lie. I would love to read this and sort of understand more in depth. What the fuck does she mean? What were they driven mad? What did they do? Probably, I mean, we can all kind of guess where all of these fucking lead, but hey. So, due to their boredom, they're like, maybe you should, uh, get out of the house sometimes and see uh, what what's out there in Wales yeah <laughs> just when you thought it story it's not gonna get any weirder they finally discovered boys and they're like ah oh, this is why I'm hormonal this is who I'm attracted to again how does this story not involve incest anyways because again nobody told these girls how to interact with boys they would get the fuck out of their house with binoculars and then they would just spy on this so they, they had a target house of course of course this is how stalkers become and develop their stalking abilities because nobody fucking tells them this is not normal <sighs> so they would like spy on this particular house to the point that they actually had a talk with their parents because the parents actually caught them spying every single day on their three children which were like teenage boys and they actually brought them inside one day and were like um Okay, this this needs to stop. Like it's all great that you you know are out out there like fucking detectives with like binoculars on spying on our kids. It's great. It's totally healthy. This needs to stop. And uh, what did these girls do? Did they let somebody tell them what to do? No, they returned these the next day. So anytime like of course they like now they're full stalker mode. They know when the parents leave the house. So when they would do these boys were intrigued, they were like, okay, these girls are clearly into us, uh, let's play it, let's uh, fuck them up. When the parents would leave, the boys would actually bring the twins inside, they would get high, they would get high. Is there anything more beautiful than twins that are silent and totally trying to do everything in sync? The twins still take drugs and try to do that. So, of course, things developed, both of these girls lost their virginity to these boys. Now it's when some sick, weird jealousy starts happening, because these boys were also playing them like a fucking fiddle. Okay, <laughs> that's not an expression, is it? So Jo now starts resenting that her sister lost her virginity first, and she also snapped at her sister because one of the boys like rejected her for Jennifer. So of course, now they're like their balance is off. They're not doing everything e at the exact same time. They're not having like one boy each and perfect relationships in sync in their fucking minds. So there is again this event where like June actually lost it at Jennifer and like she was hitting her with a break and like it was a proper attack. But again, what I kind of don't fully understand is how she didn't kill her in the end or why. It's again that psychology of like what triggers you and what makes you actually stop because we all know of you know different murderers that just stab somebody for like 100 plus times and you're like did you never think of stopping like midway through after like five stab wounds you know did you how much rage did you have did you just never fucking stop so these twins even when they were attack each other and get overwhelmed knew when to stop because they didn't actually want one and like each other dead so now, as they obviously don't have anything to compare these relationships to, because, you know, it's not like they have a glowing relationship with their fucking parents, one of the boys actually dates both of them. So one of these boys becomes mostly obsessed with Jennifer, and by obsessed I mean he would beat her up, or he would have sex with June for Jennifer to watch, psychologically fucking them up, of course. So at some point, uh, these boys leave the rural Wales, and then the girls sort of try to continue their life, and they're sleeping with other boys, but they are again isolated to a certain degree, and longer real connection. And this is where the petty crimes start. So they would vandalize 
and still because again they're bored again they're bound to their room most of the time unemployed and only talking to each other so they started getting the frills from stealing first and then once the police didn't actually care or catch them they would go- get bolder and theft soon escalated to arson until they set this tractor store on fire and they le- actually left some villagers witness the event but even then they just Again, the police didn't actually care much about what they were doing, so they would even then release them with just a warning. But now, when they keep doing it, they get caught again. Now is when they get denied bail. So again, all, like the lawyer again here and everybody at the trial thought like, yep, they're just gonna get, you know, sent maybe to, to a youth juvenile center or like a prison and get released pretty soon. But this is when they get sent to Broadmoor with sets of worst offenders and basically the guards recall this event once they were sent to to their cells first again this is like this is what you get when you separate me from my creepy twin so the guards would recall that they would again have their stiff bodies with like eyes open and not blinking I, I, I just don't believe the not blinking part I understand you were, you know, acting like your body is dead weight and trying to make it as difficult as humanly possible. But you cannot just not blink. This is this is why everything you place to these twins being describes these mystical creatures, <laughs> which again just isn't true. So the guards recall that like the first few nights, they would actually have to lift their um, stiff bodies onto the bunk beds and physically close their like shut their eyes so they would go to sleep. And this is when their boredom plays up again and they start competing with each other in these circumstances even so one of them would like eat for the other one kind of thing so like if one of them one of them would eat for like two days and the other one would starve and then they would switch and obviously what they were fighting for is for them to be a skinnier and a better twin than the other this is why like it plays to their psychology to the point that they would have never handled um being moved like one of them being moved to a better institution because you know then how would they compete against each other and see which one is better and see how they are all you know this one person because in their minds that that's how it works you know one of them starves the other one eats it's it's just it's two separate people no and it's in broadmoor when they replicated their eating you know habits In the canteen as well. In the canteen, one of them would drag the chair to sit facing the wall, and then one would sit facing the opposite direction, and then they would swap. It's just, fuck me, this is maybe OCD. I don't even know what it is at this point. But, you know, one day June is like, nah, I'm just gonna make some male moves, and she faces the wall the same day that Jennifer does. In a life where, you know, your friends are normal and your siblings are normal, this is nothing. In A Life of the Silent Twins, this, of course, leads to next level build-up. So Jennifer doesn't show that she's angry. She's like, it's it's all cool. It's great. It's not like I'm going to implode. (laughs) But she just sues and bottles this and thinks and writes about killing her sister. So in their prison diaries, they would often contemplate on, on killing each other. And they were just, because in their fucked up minds, At least in Jennifer's mind, and then she influenced June throughout the whole of her life. Their twin should basically have been born at the exact same time and have just no differences to them. So this is why, you know, they should be walking and eating and doing everything at the exact same time. All in sync. But this is not how it works from the get-go. If somebody maybe just explain basic basic childbirth of twins to these kids when they were kids maybe none of this would have happened it's like it's actually scientifically not possible for us to push you both out at the exact same time what if somebody just told them that maybe this whole thing wouldn't have escalated but then what story would I be telling you today so this is when they were in Broadmoor and then for 11 years they were playing these people up they were playing these nurses and these guards up as I mentioned and finally it led to Jennifer's death so now let's discuss the motives behind these twins and their behavior okay let me just clarify one thing I 
don't think let me know what you think but i do not think somebody can will themselves into their death so again everything about this story is just for us to perceive that hey jennifer said to the nurse one day i'm actually going to die and then the next day she falls sick no that's not how life works he's just again either working for a storyline the account of events or it is pure pure coincidence or it is that this girl somehow or it might be some foul play but then they don't say that the cause of death has anything to do with the, with the foul play in terms of motive i definitely think like everything in their life they played to this thing where they just could not coexist as twins so as they said like one of them had to die for the other one to continue the normal life and to continue to to live well as normal as possible because what june still lived like unemployed with her parents taking care of them in wales so normal to a certain degree normal is an overstatement here so what played the most is obviously child their childhood and neglect by everybody from the school to um to their parents to their classmates and this reminds me of when there's there's different cases as well where like the whole town let's say the whole street would witness a crime but then they would never report it so it's just like yep it's it's fine you know somebody else will call it you know i mean it's witnessed by a hundred people one of them must have called the police you know it's it's kind of like it's not my problem somebody else will deal with it to which again racism played a huge part because these twins were black and as i mentioned how different would have this story been if either they were black and more violent since the very young age or if they were white so everybody allowed it to escalate um and everybody really, really, even from the therapists, even from people with actual degrees who should have tried to solve their lives, believed that they like wanted to believe that they're mystical and they wanted to believe it so badly that they just wouldn't actually give them proper treatment and send them to this problem hospital, which was home to serial killers, rapists, like they were the youngest people in there. Again, how does this seem like an adequate treatment for these twins? So I guess you will either be one of those believers that believes in possession, in these strong twins connections where, you know, one knows what the other one is thinking and doing and how they're feeling and they want to do everything together and everything in sync. And yes, I do find twins slightly creepy and I don't deny some slight connections, gut feelings and all that about your twin. Okay, twins out there, don't come for me. And again, we are obsessed with this because look at the media today and how like even their therapist who actually made their story public and wrote a book about them was obsessed with them. Like everybody that remembered that I mentioned in this story from the therapist to the doctor that vaccinated them for some reason, everybody obsessed with, you know, the magical and the mystical things about these twins instead of actually focusing on, okay, these twins are fucking weird and let's get them some help or you can see it more well the way i see it where it is different events that led to them being triggered to that point where one couldn't coexist with the other and for one to want to die either so badly or to just lead themselves like to that belief so strongly i don't believe that they were willed to death or again, you can um, look at it from a more psychological or, let's say, a less spiritual way <laughs> to look into it. And it's actually just look into the facts and their childhood and their neglect. And conclude that if you do neglect your kids for a su- substantial amount of time and then they're isolated for, again, years and years, not speaking to anybody but one other human, that yes, both of them will want to continue their life that way and they will find the way to stop coexisting. Well, that's the case of the Gibbons twins. Now, on to the rapid fire facts, of course, here. Here, let's just uh, mention a couple of names of the couple of celebrities of Broadmoor Hospital. So the most famous one was Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. It's debatable, like, who was the most famous one? This is the one where I spotted immediately from the list. I just actually googled how he looks like. He had a proper mullet. Oh my god, I didn't think, like, mullets were a thing in the UK. Apparently, I, I was wrong, guys. I was wrong all this time. So Broadmoor hosted Christiana Edmonds, which was named the Chocolate Cream Poisoner. 
of course, of course, I'm all over her new Wikipedia page. And I definitely want to cover somebody called uh, the Chocolate Dream Poisoner, even though it's probably more boring than the media name that they have given her. Ronald Cray, one of the Cray twins, apparently some gang member, again, they're called the Cray twins. Why does nobody cover this crime? And then there was two people, actually, that tried to assassinate Queen Victoria. I didn't know that Queen Victoria was the one that was like... Queen Victoria is basically glorified in everything I have ever read. Which I had to do life in the UK test, okay? I read about Queen Victoria. But apparently there was a poet that tried to assassinate her and then barmen again that attempted to assassinate her. That were all hospitalized there. Interesting. Interesting. You can, of course, find the full list on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the source that keeps on giving. Perfect segue. Speaking of sources for this podcast... They have been Unexplained Mysteries on Parkas, Morbid Podcast, this beautiful article on New Yorker, just like a long form, but it's so worth reading. I'm gonna post the link to it in the description. We two made one. It's that type of long form journalism that we all love. And ranker.com. And uh, weirdly enough, I haven't used Wikipedia to research on these twins. Just on, you know, Broadmoor Hospital. Just a note, this is already at 1 hour 15 minutes. This is gonna be some bitching editing because this episode is not going to last 1 hour 15 minutes. Shoot myself in the foot because I need to edit it for hours. Okay, uh, I love you guys. I do this because I love you, okay? Okay. <laughs> dun 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 dun. Now, onto everybody's favorite part of this episode, where I recommend you shit, which uh, recently haven't been all true crime, have they? Which is great, guys. I feel like I don't just bombard myself with that content. There's other things that you can listen to and about anything, about words, about happiness. What am I on about? The most commonly asked question on this podcast, what the hell are you on about, Maya? So everybody here knows I love words, right? Like, am I from here? No. Do I stop this podcast to Google other words and learn words as as I go? Yep. (laughs) Yep, multiple times. But as you know, I'm fascinated with like different words in different languages that can't be translated. In that light, I wanted to recommend one book that I read a while ago. And like, I kind of always go back to it to, you know, sometimes when I speak with internationals and they're like, ha, oh, there's this word in my language that nobody can actually understand in another one. I'm like, yes, I get you. And then I bombard them with, you know, <laughs> words and expressions in my language. It's by a British polyglot, Alex Rawlings. It's called From Am- Moret to Jal. Really, it's fucking epic. It's just like different countries and then he goes through the words in those countries that don't have a translation in any other one and it, it's, it just makes your day and you like kind of feel like more related to people. That is if you if you like words and you're not a fucking freak. Why I got reminded of this is because of the audiobook that I just actually finished today. And it is by Helen Russell. It's called The Atlas of Happiness. And again, it just hit all the right notes. Again, the principle is, this is, by the way, the author that wrote the book The Year of Living Danishly. And yes, yeah, since then, I'm kind of obsessed. Like, I follow what she does and I always had this one on my radar. But I didn't know that it's going to be sort of the same principle of, like, the other book that I just mentioned. So she basically focuses on researching happiness in different countries. And then she pulled these words that, again, are related to it. So, I don't know, like, Meraki in Greek, which we stole in Serbia. Hey, guys which is that feeling where like you are so overwhelmed by joy i don't know if like a song hits you or like you just finish a delicious meal and you have no words to describe it but you're like this is what hit me this is that's my rock okay (laughs) or sobremesa in spanish which is where people still stay sitting around the table while the meal has finished you know they're like they're full they're just sharing stories it's all about this family about the feels after a delicious meal that you share and you just enhance family and friendship relations. So it's kind of like that, but in many more countries. And again, she researches it in depth. So it kind of goes into this, like what she found out from the interviews and how that relates to those expressions and how then those expressions relate to the stereotypes of the country as a whole. Did it make me happier? You could say so. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the point of it. It would be weird if it made me sadder by some (laughs) chance. Oh my God, you know what else made me super happy? Uh, This is... This is the level of fame I can live with and I want and I just want it to happen at any point in my life. (laughs) 
So, as I mentioned, the fact that I'm denying myself certain foods or drinks every month means that obviously I develop other obsessions. I have been buying jacket potatoes from this place locally. (laughs) And this week I literally walked in, I didn't even close the door. The guy just, like, screamed. The guy just screamed from the other end, like, jacket potato. And, like, everybody heard it. I was like, I can live with this level of fame. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with being a regular in this place. And they had it ready in like three minutes. They probably knew I was coming, thinking of me. Ah, the sad life I live. Well, that's my highlight for a week, pretty much. Except, oh, except actually last night. After like a particularly mentally tough day at work. As everybody knows, because I tell you at every single episode <laughs> how stuck I am when it comes to like my own job in customer service and how I should have gotten after it about two years ago. So yeah, so I'm like in the job where I reached situation points about two years ago so now it's every time it's like oh this is a new level you know this is this is a new situation point that we didn't know we could reach i'm like i genuinely cannot do this any longer and then you know another day comes and i'm like here we go again as i finished particularly weird shift i I thought like i was going to record and i was like i really can't give it to the people like i can't give myself like this would be such a bummer podcast (laughs) if i was to record it today it's like let's just go to the gym sweat it out forget that this ever happened (laughs) except it keeps happening every day for years but yeah (laughs) forget that this is my life (laughs) and for the first time in how many years that i have been going to the gym like back and forth on and off (laughs) You know, let's not say I'm a regular. Don't Google how I look like. (laughs) I have actually managed to get out of my head and do box jumps, which I psychologically never so far could do. You know, everybody's like, well, round of applause, what a success. For me, it was. (laughs) I was always just petrified. Okay, it's scary. It's like you're jumping, but not in the air, but on an object. You can fall down. I reach a point where I don't care. I don't care if people laugh. But actually go in the sections where people who know what they're doing go. So yeah, that was my hooray of the freaking day. After a pretty shitty day, I was like, wow. You know, had I not gone to the gym, I would have never known. I would have never gotten out of my head. Well, probably at a later stage at some point in life. I would be doing, you know, box jumps, but Moral of the story, seize your shitty days as well, okay? What have you done this week to get out of your shitty life? Share it with me, guys. How have you turned your shitty days around, you know? How have you reached your job situations, but then have turned it all around and be like, nah, my sense of humor is getting me through this. Podbam at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter, that bam pod. Or, you know, join the Patreon community again, patreon.com forward slash that bam pod. Speaking of Patreon, actually, the March episode is already out there right now. So you can just head after the episode and listen to that. And then today's mini-sode that's under the title and now we go to is out there as well. So in the mini-sode I take a psychopath test. So you can do that with me because so why not? We just went through the silent twins that have been diagnosed as psychopaths. So you know, internet tests can definitely diagnose us correctly, right? Right? Do it with me, guys. And then the extra content episode for March is out there and it's on different laws that have been changed because of criminal cases. So we are talking stuff like Amber Alert here, you know, like all of those cases that then inspired the laws that haven't been there in the first place and that have been named after the victims. So I'm covering some of the most famous ones. You can always suggest what else have I missed out on because that's the beauty of the community. The links are all below and share it with everybody, yeah. Because as you might have guessed, this podcast is probably listened to by people like you who don't really like the jobs they might want to start their own podcast and they might be into true crime just like you they might be into this much because we're covering really weird shit so hey i offer you a community of uh people who hate their life and then they turn it around and then they hate it less (laughs) i mean what more can you want (laughs) just a world where you know we try each day to make it a better place by saving it one motive at a time wow i i did you see that twist coming? Did you see how I put that into a sentence? <laughs> yeah, it's it's time. It's that time of Monday where I leave you to move on with your day. One more at a time, guys. Uh, bye!